1114, can you start towards Cedar Bluff? We got a report of 1114, got hit by a tractor trailer. He's not answering his radio. Uh, I'm on the interstate. Is he eastbound or westbound? I believe it's going to be westbound. I cannot confirm. They're advising a uh, 1090 vehicle, and he is still inside. 1211, Austin, level road. He is out of the vehicle, but he is injured. Uh, 1046, involving 1114. His vehicle's 1090. They have got him out of the vehicle, but he is injured. I'm going to go ahead and notify 1201. The callers to 911 say that his vehicle was hit by a tractor trailer. 1211, be advised, they've got uh, 14 in an ambulance. First city, uh, he's not doing too good. Welcome, gentlemen, to Fire Pit Friday. It is so wonderful to see you at the Fire Pit. This Thank is great. Us. Trial by Fire is a book that I personally picked up, read, and fell in love with. So it's my pleasure to have you on Fire Pit Friday. And I'd like to introduce you to the podcast audience. We have Dr. Paul Grady, who is a co-author of Trial by Fire, and, of course, Sergeant Lowell Russell with the Tennessee Highway Patrol. Um, thank you so much for being here, Sergeant Russell, and thank you so much, Dr. Grady. Thank you for having us. Um, this, the book itself, Trial by Fire, is about preparing yourself for trials. Absolutely. Um, everyone has trials, everyone has ups and downs, but this book, if you ever need inspiration on any level, this is such an inspiration. But I want to go straight to... March 13th, 2012, because that's the date that revolves uh, and the beginning of Trial by Fire for you, Sergeant. This is something that uh, maybe you want to take it from there. Tell us your story. Well, thank you for having us here. It's an honor to be here and always good to be here in Nashville. And I hope your viewers find it interesting to hear my story. I think that the, you know, the, the book when we wrote it uh, comes out, like you said, talking about trials. And you know, the main theme is, is God's got a... Uh, uh, plan for all of us and he puts little things through our lives but <clears throat> excuse me but March the 13th 2012 I really don't remember much of it um, I guess that the most that I gather from is what people's told me in the end of it but I was sitting on the shoulder of I-40 in West Knoxville over to Gallagher View exit and I had just written a ticket for speeding and the driver of the car I'd let him go and I was sitting there making notes on the back of the ticket like I had done time and time before and as I was sitting there writing those notes so I can remember what I was going to say in court a tractor and trailer driver had fallen asleep and veered off the right shoulder of the road and struck the rear of the, rear of the patrol car the patrol car was knocked across three lanes of traffic into a concrete barrier and then slid backwards another three or four hundred feet and uh, as it was doing so it caught on fire and um, <clears throat> in the book I tell about it the distance from impact to final rest was about a football field in length. So, you know, it was a pretty bad impact. And of course, I was knocked out. And luckily, by the grace of God, there was the ambulance that was following the truck that hit me. And, you know, the ambulance wasn't even from Knox County, it mm -hmm. was from McMinn County, which is about 30 miles south of where we had hit. And they just so happened to be up there dropping a patient off at uh, a hospital there in Knoxville. <clears throat> and in that ambulance was Freddie Leslie and Christy Graham. And uh, as they topped the hill, uh, the truck had hit me, and I, my car was spinning across the three lanes of traffic into that barrier and slid backwards, like I said, and they they seen that part of the wreck. So they pulled up to the scene, and the car was on fire, and they jumped out. And uh, by that time, the truck driver was back there to, at the car, and uh, they had gotten my driver's door open, and you'll see on the front of the book, that's the only door on the car that would open. And uh, I was always in the habit of wearing my seatbelt. And luckily that night, of course, I had my seatbelt on and and uh, I was uh, just stuck in the car because they couldn't get the seatbelt off of me because yeah. whenever a car, or any <clears throat> car, not just a patrol car, any car gets hit, the seatbelt locks tight and that's for safety reasons. So they tried to unbuckle me and they couldn't and of course the fire was consuming the car and uh, <clears throat> they was using a fire extinguisher and then they went through another fire extinguisher 
And this guy by the name of Dennis Stevens, and he was from Frenchville, Tennessee. He just left the Sam's Club of there. And he wandered up on the scene, and out of all the things that he could have in his pocket, he had a box cutter. Yeah, who would ever thought to have a box cutter on him? Now, Andrew Keith, this happened just uh, just a second or two before uh, Dennis Stevens come over to where we was. But Andrew Keith had pulled up. He had seen me. He's an Oxford police officer, by the way. He had passed me before I'd got hit and seen the blue lights on. And he had exited off the next exit and come back around to check on me and see if there's anything I needed for the traffic stop. And uh, he had forgot his pocket knife at home that night. Which officers, we never so, forget our pocket no, knife. You always have your knife yes, with it's, you. Yes, it's a very unusual thing to happen. Wow. So, of course, they're on their second fire extinguisher at that time. And uh, Andrew Keith with Knoxville Police Department was up there. And they, of course, they couldn't cut me out because he didn't have his pocket knife. And, of course, Dennis Stevens comes up. And they're on their third fire extinguisher at this time. And the car was just burning, you know, just... The fire was consuming and you're it. Still in the car. It was. I was still in the car, and of course unconscious. And uh, the fire was. They would There's not. You'll see the picture of the car, but there's not much left of the trunk. The car was in. The fire was in the back seat and in the radio box that was right beside me, and in the passenger seat. And of course, it's all the way up against that wall, except for that driver's door is open, and here I am, sitting there unconscious, and they can't get me out. And uh, Dennis Stevens walks up with that box cutter in his pocket. So they cut the seat belt and they still couldn't get me out. So as a last resort, Freddie Leslie says, I'm not going to let him burn. And he grabbed me by my left leg and just started pulling. And for some reason, I popped out at that time. And he pulled me down there on I-40, in the middle of I-40 in Knoxville. And of course, uh, traffic was blocked and they were sitting there doing CPR on me because uh, my vitals was just dropped out. And I think on the first initial check they done is I didn't have a blood pressure or anything is what the report showed but they was doing CPR on me about that time Steve Taylor with KPD pulled up and uh, one thing that I never would have thought of happening of course I knew that what I had in the trunk of my car you know I, I knew that you know if I ever needed any extra bullets or whatever I've got them back there mm -hmm. and but I never would have thought that uh, by the car burning up those bullets would get so hot and they would shoot off and mm -hmm. Dover, especially where we were. And anyway, Steve Taylor pulled up seeing that, you know, the people here doing CPR on me in the middle of I-40 in right. West Knoxville. Mm -hmm. And these bullets going off and he's concerned that, you know, they're going to get shot while right. trying to do c CPR on me to keep me alive. So being quick thinking like he was, he jumped in an ambulance, pulled an ambulance in between where they was doing CPR on me at and the patrol car and to shield the bullets. And then, uh, they get me stable enough to take me to UT Hospital, and they take me to UT. UT is the only uh, level one trauma hospital there close by that they could take me to. So they took me over there and spent 46 days in the hospital, and that includes the time I spent at uh, Patricia Neal mm -hmm. in uh, inpatient rehabilitation. Oh my gosh, that, that one moment, that one moment has a huge thread of um, challenging stories that has that's built your your survival your rehabilitation and then now you giving back um giving back by telling your story um i want to talk a little bit about chapter six chapter six is my very favorite chapter okay of course chapter six is the frankie watson chapter and um that four years uh, my dad passed away in november 2009 and then uh, in 2010, four months later, my mother passed away unexpectedly. And then the next year, 2011, we lost uh, Frankie Watson. And Frankie had came to live with me and my family in 2004. I'd first met Frankie in 2002. And every, the story behind that is every month, whenever I was working the road as a trooper, I would always spend one day to where I'd go to the schools and eat lunch with the kids and the teachers. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was just part of being a police officer, be out there seen in the community. Mm -hmm. So this particular day in 2002, I went to eat with uh, Mike Lowry. He was the principal over there in Sweetwater. And uh, Frankie Watson came up to me and he says, I think you know some of my family. And I asked him who he was and who his family was. And of course I did. And so we talked for a few minutes. And of course I didn't see Frankie too much between 2002 and 2004. 
and except you know I'd see him in passing or in his grandparents' house every now and then I'd run into him. But uh, <clears throat> in 2004, I had hired his aunt and uncle to uh, uh, watch a fireworks tent that I had set up for the Fourth of July holidays, and I ended up taking Frankie home one morning, and because they would sit up and watch the movies the whole night to make sure nobody mm-hmm. mess with the fireworks tent in the middle of the night, mm-hmm. and uh, so Frankie said. Uh, you know, asked me to see if I could take him to football practice occasionally. And I was like, well, I don't care as long as your dad don't care. Sure. And I pulled up. And, like a uh, big brother. Yeah, yeah. I went up and talked to his dad, and I knew his dad uh, before then. And uh, so I said, anytime, you know, you need me to take Frank to football practice, let me know. And, and it developed where, you know, I, and I always thought that if I ever had a chance to help uh, somebody out like mm-hmm. Coach Dave Evans did for me, mm-hmm. I would. And in the book, it tells a story about how Coach Evans and helped me out through high school. And like I said, I was very poor. And uh, whenever I met Frankie, it just clicked that maybe this is who I need to help out to give back to my community. And That's a parent. To, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I seen that op- opportunity and want to take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad I did today. Mm-hmm. And then between the time he graduated at uh, Paris Island and the time he was deployed, he spent a lot of that time in training. He went to, out to California, I think it's 29 Palms, and mm-hmm. training. And then he deployed over there and spent about uh, a month and a half until September 24th. Of course, he was in the Marines and a sniper had shot him whenever he had, uh, was exited in a, a cornfield in Afghanistan. And it was in Sajin, Afghanistan. And then I was uh, listed as one of his next of kin, and along with his parents. And so, as when they came to the house, and they told me during the planning of his funeral, is when we created a scholarship. And what we do is, is we give a thousand dollars to a graduate that's from uh, Sequoia High School. That's where Frankie graduated and mm-hmm. played four years of football. Out. So we give a thousand dollar scholarship to a graduate that's going into some sort of public service, mm-hmm. or the military and uh, you know public service is not just limited to police officers you know there's a lot of public service mm-hmm. careers I mean teachers for example is public service and mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of good people out there that uh, does things for the right reason and no matter what people do in life I've, I always try whenever I go talk to the kids in schools and stuff I always try to tell them you know find that one thing you're good at and be the best that you can be at right. Uh, there's not a day that goes by I don't think about him. In fact, there's only really two things I remember the night of my wreck. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I went to work at 11 o'clock mm-hmm. on March mm-hmm. the 12, 2000. Yeah, March the 12, 2012. Mm-hmm. And whenever I went to work, I was in the habit of going by and just checking on his grave because at one time we had some people steal some stuff off his grave. And I remember that night going by his grave. And the other thing is I stopped up there and talked to a police officer in Alcoa, Officer Dustin Cook. But that's the only two things I remember all that night. Now, weren't you thinking of, um, you were putting together a, a slideshow of some sort? What were you doing? You were putting together something for Frankie? Well, the uh, I got a little slideshow that whenever I go out and speak to mm-hmm. uh, different churches, in mm-hmm. fact, I try to spend one Sunday of the month, usually it's the fourth Sunday of the month, to go to a different church to thank the ones that had me on the prayer list because I want to make sure that uh, I go out and tell them how much I appreciate it because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the power of prayer. And, you know, even though I've still got problems with my back and can't move my neck and my left side of my vocal cords are still partially paralyzed, I feel that it's pretty important to go out and thank the people that prayed for me. But uh, <clears throat> in that PowerPoint, I've got a video that I was putting together after Frankie had got killed on September 24th, 2011. Mm -hmm. And I was going through trying to pick out all the pictures that we had of Frankie Mm -hmm. and make sure I got, uh, you know, his life set to Mm -hmm. just some sort of story and some music. And Mm -hmm. while we was planning the funeral, we had found a uh, song that he was singing, American Soldier, and I wanted to make sure I put that in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the video is 12 minutes and one second long. So I was putting that together to put out on uh, YouTube mm-hmm. on the on his birthday and of course I was hit about a month or so before his birthday and couldn't, couldn't do, do that and so ended up after I woke up in the hospital found out what was going on still couldn't work on him of course I wasn't uh, 
capable of doing it at that time. Whenever I finally got out and back home, I could start working on it slowly, and I put it the, the year anniversary to his death. I put it back on the internet. Wow! And don't you feel as if um, he was there protecting you? I tell you what, if there was any person there, I think that's good Lord and Frankie Watson yeah. who protected me that night. Yeah, yeah. The bond, um, the connection, and the thoughts and visiting his grave, and all of that means something. You really didn't read the book. You, you're picking out a lot of little things that could easily be overlooked. Are you going to test me now? <laughs> no, no you've, you've already passed. You've definitely already passed. Doctor. Dr. Green. Yes, ma'am. Question for you. You're a huge, huge advocate and inspiration for the book in itself, but also you are that visionary who, uh, who approached Sergeant uh, Russell, and I keep wanting to say Lowell, I love your name, by the way. That's okay. Call me whatever you want. Paul Fine, Roll Fine. It just rolls off the tongue. But um, can you can you talk about the day that your epiphany came and you were talking about? Okay. Well, I, it kind of goes back into my own personal story before I ever met Lowell. Um, my background was ministerial before I ever got into law enforcement. That's why I'm kind of a, my wife jokes and says I am a living smorgasbord because <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm a minister, I'm a chaplain, I'm a teacher, I'm a, a law enforcement officer. So mm -hmm. I've, I've always got my hands in something somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, she gets mad when I don't put my phone on airplane mode at night because it goes off two or three, four o'clock in the morning <laughs> every week sometimes. So, um, but my background is ministerial. I've been a minister for 22 years and um, I, uh, when I became a law enforcement officer, I wanted to kind of bring the two together. And I kind of did prior to that because I became a law enforcement chaplain before I became a law enforcement officer. And while I'd still do both kind of in a bivocational fashion, mm -hmm. I wanted to further extend it onto the law enforcement side. And I thought, well, I'd like to maybe write a daily devotional. Mm -hmm. And when you look at how the scriptures lay out uh, a Christian perspective, 75% of the Bible was written under the time of the law. So to find legal... Uh, verses or scriptures to speak about and write a little one page, page and a half daily devotion. It shouldn't be that hard because there's thousands of verses that deal with with, mm -hmm. with warrior mentality, with uh, with the, the law, uh, morality, all kinds of codes, justice, all everything. It shouldn't be hard to come up with 365. And when I first started having the concept of doing that for a book, I mean, I immediately had 50, 60 of them just pop in my head right away. Uh, you could do that verse, that verse, that verse, that passage, that kind of a thing. And mm -hmm. so I thought, oh man, this will be a piece of cake. So I, uh, I finally, after about thinking about it for a couple months, and, and by part, my, the reason I kind of delayed on was because I was still a rookie as a cop, and I thought, well, nobody's going to take it serious if a rookie cop's talking about how to, you know, have spiritual inspiration in the job, but I'm still learning. Right. And I hadn't, I hadn't really gone through a lot of my own critical instances on the job yet to be able to draw back on my faith and say, yeah, you're not just talking about something you read, it sounds good, you've been able to draw forward us experience, personal experience. Okay. And, uh, but I started, well, I'll go ahead and start listing these now because I, once I list them, then I can go back and expand them and actually write them. And mm -hmm. yes, it'll take a few years to do that. But, but when it came time to write, I couldn't think of the subjects I wanted to talk about. And that frustrated me. So it was, I felt as if that was the Lord kind of just closing the door uh, of my mind so I could not expand on that department. And I continued to pray over, Lord, what would you have me to do? And for about two months, the Lord put Lowell on my heart about his story, writing his story, getting good. And, and, and I was I was a little bit, I don't want to say intimidated, because Lowell and I were friends and colleagues. I was his chaplain at Highway Patrol, but we were also friends in addition to colleagues. In fact, the first day I met Lowell was the day Frankie was killed. That was the first time I was dispatched. As, that was my first call as a chaplain for Highway Patrol. I worked as a chaplain for Knoxville Police Department as well. I, I still didn't know how to approach Lowell. And, and by this point, Lowell was kind of a, a local celebrity and everything. And, and uh, I thought maybe I knew more than God. Maybe it was just an emotional feeling. So I, I kind of kept trying to put it off, put it off. But the more I, I, I thought about it, I mean, the, the vision for the cover even came to me, what it would look like, um, the, 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 some of the, the title for the book. I knew the title for the book before I ever talked to Lowell about the book. And, and, uh, and I'll take a little joke from Lowell's side of the story. Typically he says how much he's appreciative of my influence in the book because if he had done one on his own, it would have been a pop-up book. And I said, well, Papa Book probably would have sold better because they're fun, you know, but, but, but we didn't do that. But I, I finally had a Thanksgiving dinner at the Highway Patrol office uh, in, the, in Knoxville. I had I brought one of my daughters with me, and uh, Lowell sat at my table. We chit-chatted for a while, then he had to leave. And I told my daughter, I said, look, you're in a room with 50 cops. Just stay here. You're good. And I said, Lowell, can I walk you out to your truck? I said, sure. And I said, I got something to talk with you about. 
and they're in the parking lot November just a week maybe two weeks before Thanksgiving 2013 I uh, approached him about this and I expected him to say well I appreciate it let me get back with you mm-hmm. so I could turn around and go back to God and say see I told you so mm-hmm. which typically he He's smarter than we are, mm-hmm. you know. But I, but I thought of this instant I might have an edge on God, but it didn't work. His little eyes got about the size of silver dollars, and he said, "Yes, we can use this for the Frankie Watson Scholarship Fund." You were and, forward and, and thinking in my, that. And my, yes, and in my mind, I'm going, "No, no, no, that's not the reaction I'm looking for. I don't want to do this." So we both had that element of doubt, which is okay. Just like the centurion who wanted his daughter healed in Matthew, he said, "Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief." And because he had the faith, his faith was exercised right. through the doubt, God blessed it. And right. I think that's what happened with us. And and as much as I had the vision for it, I, I really couldn't imagine it coming together as good as it did. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, when I heard the story, when I uh, went to the training center and I actually heard the story in the beginning and then reading the book, this needs to be told. Absolutely. Uh, an inspiration for everyone. Everyone has trials, tribulations to step in someone's shoes and walk a mile, you know, just in their shoes, but to then turn around and give back, that's, that's coming full circle in life. A lot of people get stuck. You know how you were stuck for just a little bit? Yes. Show me the way. I'm kind of stuck. Well, there's a lot of people out there who are in the same boat. And so telling your story is important. There's a, there's an old spiritual cliche, let go and let God. Mm -hmm. And it, it, like I said, it, it's definitely very cliche, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of truth in oh, there's that a lot because of truth. I'll probably botch it here, but I, I, I'm not a poet. Um, I wrote three poems my wife and we were dating. That was the last time I wrote poems. That was 15 years ago, so I don't, I'm not a poet. But there was a poem that really touched my life about 20 years ago, and I'll probably mess it up a little bit, but it says something along the lines of, as ch- children bring their broken toys to us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. Instead of leaving him to work with ways which were his own, I stayed around and tried to help with ways that were my own. At last, I snatched them back and cried, My God, how could you be so slow? My child, what could I do? He said, You never did let go. And sometimes where people struggle coming through trials is not being able to let go of the fact that things are going to change. Mm -hmm. Things are not going to be the same. Accepting their new reality. Mm -hmm. And they get hung up in, like the old little Texas song, What Might Have Been. And Lowell's whole life from the time he was a child, and again, we talk about it in the book, he wanted to be a police officer. I mean, that was something with the exception of two years. And I'm, three years. I'm, three years, I'm sorry, and I'm stealing his thunder. I'll let you tell that part. Go ahead. Well, of course, uh, whenever we put the book together, I wanted to put like a little journal and stuff in there for the police officers and military. It's dedicated to law mm-hmm. enforcement and military. Mm-hmm. And the reason behind that is is because whenever I was young, my mom and dad got me a book called School Days. And, you know, it's sort of a little journal as you go through school. You yeah. put down what you wanted to be when you grow up and had a place for your height, your weight, a little picture and stuff. So where it's got your careers you wanted to go in, it's got little check marks in there where I checked what I wanted to be. And every year except for three years, I checked police officer. And it's a calling to do that for, for your life, even when you retire, it's still in you. Mm-hmm. And Lowell felt that calling from a child. And that fast was gone. When a when a fully loaded tractor trailer, going from Pennsylvania to Texas, fully loaded eighteen wheeler with thousands of pounds, it's already going to be several tons empty. Then several tons of tra- of uh, construction equipment on the back of it hits him at sixty nine miles an hour from behind, and crushes his car about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, a full size Ford Crown Victoria Cruiser. And knocks him 200, I think it was 267 feet into, in, a tail, in a spin already, I mean, immediately burst in flames. It's on fire as it's spinning. And then he slams into a concrete barrier and slides on the 60 plus feet. There's, in the book, we list all the ways Lowell should have died and um, all the injuries he sustained. And, and uh, the, the one that blows my mind the most is how Lowell should have not only died in the crash. Um, from the crash, just from the mere impact of his organs impacting against the, the cavity of his right. body. That's that's one of the three impacts that happens in a crash. Right. Um, but he should have died because he, he suffered, I believe it was called an occipital dislocation. That's where the brain separates from the spinal column. Mm-hmm. You have no activity going from the brain to the spinal column to tell to do everything. Right. 
and because it's separated, the the signal's separated. Mm-hmm. And laying there with a fracture, a basal skull fracture on the base, it could have very easily penetrated the cerebral cortex and, and killed him that way by impaling his own brain on his own spinal column. And the fact that when when Freddie grabbed his leg and just, Freddie tells me the story, he just kind of fell back. And that's what popped him loose. His body's just kind of bouncing as it's being pulled out. There, He shouldn't have survived just getting pulled out of the car. So when you when you see the miracle, and, and a lot of people like to say coincidence, coincidence. I mean, the oh, people yeah. that don't have a, a faith base yeah. want to say, well, that's a lot of coincidences. I be, I prefer to look at it, and Lowell prefers to look at it as divine providence. Yeah. And then touching on what you just said, let's talk about forgiveness. I uh, knew I was going to do something to try to help the truck driver that hit me. And I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that he tried to help me get out of the car that night. And then... I was able to uh, write a victim impact statement to the court, uh, which uh, when he was going up for uh, his sentencing or whatever that's going to do with him, and I had included this in the back of the book and the letter that I wrote asking for him to just get probation instead of uh, any kind of jail time, and you know, so that's what I got to do for the truck driver that uh, hit me. Like I said, he didn't have to get out and try to help me out of the car that night, but he did. So did you walk away from uh, this experience with a larger heart? <laughs> did your heart grow? <laughs> you know, I don't, uh, I don't know if there's a way to measure it, but I guarantee you this, I value life more. And uh, it really brought in perspective that God's got a plan for me. And I hope that I, well, I hope that we, like I said, I couldn't wrote this book without Paul. And mm-hmm. he was, uh, he's the reason the book's here. Where are you going from here? Where where is this book taking you? Where is the next step? It's kind of a twofold thing. One, it is a book, mm-hmm. so we want people to read the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, our our initial vision for the book was we wanted um, to get the book to every law enforcement officer in the country. If you look at corrections and law enforcement in general, mm-hmm. it's about a million and a half officers. I, I don't know how to do it, but we would love to give a free copy to every officer in the country. What if this message of faith and hope and peace, thankfulness, forgiveness, all of these things could be reached, could we save one's life? That's beautiful. Whether physically or spiritually or both. Mm-hmm. That's that's a very big burden. And, and mm-hmm. personally, out of our own pocket, so to speak, we've given out 2,000 copies to law enforcement officers free. Uh, we're kind of tapped out. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, as far as what we can do ourselves, we'd love to find someone that maybe there's a capital investor that right. that needs to put money into a nonprofit. We're actually working to build a nonprofit, a 501c3, in honor of Frankie Watson that this right. can be done through if they want a tax you know, relief or something like that to donate that we can continue to send these books out all over the country. Mm-hmm. That's one. Two is we want the, the just not just law enforcement, but because we wrote it initially for law enforcement officers, but it's such an unbelievable mm-hmm. human interest story from his birth to today. Right. It's such an unbelievable story that that general the general public loves this book. Mm-hmm. It's not just law enforcement. Mm-hmm. It's not just for first responders or military. Mm-hmm. And we want to get the word out to people where they can order the book mm-hmm. and get the book for themselves. Mm-hmm. And then thirdly, I've had, I don't know how many people in the last several months that have approached us to saying, you've got to get this into a movie. Yes. And, yes. and, and, and a lot of them have referenced the movie Courageous, how this would be like a sequel to it. Not, I, mean, I don't know mm-hmm. who or what, but, mm-hmm. but it, it is. It's a faith-based movie mm-hmm. of hope and courage, and mm-hmm. it's got... And it's got all the theatrics you'd ask yeah. for it in a drama, Absolutely. action, comedy, family. You could definitely see it in a movie uh, you know, theater. It's, it's, it's definitely a story not just to be read but to be seen, in my opinion. It would be great to be able to pick mm-hmm. up a publisher or an agent that can help move the book or mm-hmm. help move it into the movie rights, those kind of things. If there's anybody anybody, anybody out there that out knows there that, who has them. those connections, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll leave contact information. Right be able to do those. Mm-hmm. If you go to Atlas Books, like at Atlas, A-T-L-A-S, atlasbooks.com, mm-hmm. it'll actually automatically redirect you into Bookmasters, but into their ordering page. Great. And when you're there, there's a little search engine. All you have to do is either put in our names, Lowell Russell, mm-hmm. Paul Grady, or Trial by Fire. Any of those will work. Mm-hmm. And 
and we'll bring up the book. And we'll have a link on, on our website as yeah. well. And, 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 and yeah, you'll have the link, but you also, all you got to do is that, and it'll take you right to the book. You can order the book there. Great. <laughs> we also have a uh, trial by fire uh, Facebook page. They can yes. go yes. on there, and on then Facebook. there's links on there. And you, the, you update your tours. You update um, yeah. your We're having a speaking engagement. Speaking we'll actually, engagements. We'll actually be putting this on to our that page would be great. in advance. Would... Trying to have travel traffic to you. Also. But you have to, if you go on Facebook, you have to go <laughs> Trial by Fire Lowell Russell. Otherwise, there's about 15 Trial by Fire pages, music groups, things like that. You won't find us there. Okay. What would be the last ending thing you would like to leave the audience? Just summing things up, what, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to hear loud and clear? Well, the overall theme of the book is, is it's got a couple of themes that run parallel with each other at the same time. One is um, everything in life prepares you for the next stage of life. And if you can't handle it when your apple cart's upset at this level, you may not be able to handle it at the next level. So be able to learn from life's lessons. And life is what you make it. And the other one is, well, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this. Life is what you make it. But you can either be dictated to by your problems or you can dictate to your problems. Your problems can become your own solutions. I know that sounds kind of odd to say that, but it's very true. It's very true. Life doesn't stop because you don't. it's not what you want it to be. And then what I'm inspired by is what you're giving back. You're giving back. You could have stopped there. You could have stopped there, but you didn't. And I'm just so inspired by you, your book. Thank you for having us. It's an honor to come down here. Yes, we really enjoyed our time. Amazing. Thank you very much.